Hello everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started with this week's chapter here in just a second. I apologize that link was not working properly until about five minutes before class, so we may have some people joining a little bit late. Sorry about that, I did not have the other screen muted, so there was a little bit of an echo. But the link was not working properly, so we are starting a little bit late today. And, and as we go, we'll probably have a couple of people joining a little bit late, and that is all right. So you had your first exam. You guys all did really well. I do want to start by saying that I am so proud and impressed at how easily you guys have transitioned to this new method of learning, even though that wasn't something that you had signed up for. But you guys are doing a really great job, and I really appreciate you working so hard. I did add a curve to your first exam grade, so there was a five-point curve, and there will be a five-point curve on all other exams as well. So definitely go and check that out to see where your grade is now. I'll be updating the Chapter 4 grades here in just a minute after we finish this class so that you'll have your participation grade on those. And I'll also be posting the exam review for Exam 2 after class today. So that should cover um, just about all the things that we have coming up that you need information on. If you do have any other questions, please definitely feel free to leave those in the comment box and I'll cover them as we move through this chapter. So the chapter that we're covering today is chapter six. This chapter is Intro to Macroeconomics and GDP. Now, it kind of sounds like with it being an intro to macroeconomic chapter that this is something that should have maybe been one of the first chapters, but it is important that you kind of understand some of the foundations that we've covered before we dive into this chapter. Um, you'll notice that we did skip chapter five. The only reason that we do that in this class is because of our time constraint of the eight-week course. You will not be tested on any information from chapter five. But it's still a really good chapter, and it's really interesting. If you have time, definitely take a look at that. So let's go ahead and move into this chapter. Now, before we get into this misconception, just remember that previously we talked about consumer and producer surplus and also excise taxes. Those excise taxes were things on like gasoline, cigarettes, alcohol, any of these taxes that can sometimes create a deadweight loss. But this chapter kind of gets a little bit more into just an overall coverage of what macroeconomics is. Now, one of the most common misconceptions with macroeconomics is that there's not really a reliable way to determine how well an entire economy is performing. As we look through some of this data and we talk about some of these different scenarios, um, it's important to understand that economists do often disagree about the state of our economy. One of the reasons being for this is that we do have a bipartisan government structure. Um, people typically will use their political views as a driver for some of their economic beliefs. And, you know, not saying that one way or the other is right, just saying that depending on your political beliefs or your beliefs about any number of things, this can sometimes influence your economic beliefs and how economists view the state of the economy. Now, there are some objective and reliable measures of macroeconomic performance, and that's going to be what we're primarily focusing on in this chapter. So, almost eight years after the official end of the Great Recession, the financial news is still filled with heated debates about the health of the economy. Especially now, with our current pandemic situation, you're going to find economists claiming both positive and negative conditions, but overall, we're sort of trending in quite a negative direction with our current state of events. You may remember in the late 2000s, there were a lot of different discussions about whether or not the economy actually was in a recession. And um, economists really couldn't agree on whether the economy was headed in a positive or negative direction, but they did eventually see that we were going into a great recession. And the reason being is because of some of these objective measures. Now, one of the measures that's going to be the most commonly used and widely accepted is going to be our measure of gross domestic product, or GDP. And this has been used to gauge macroeconomic performance since about the time of the Great Depression. And, um, you know, the data for this existed for much longer, but it really became usable and widespread after the Great Depression. So we'll get into that a little more here in a minute. 
So our big questions for today, we want to know how is macro different than micro? That should be something that sounds kind of familiar and you already have a bit of an idea. We're going to talk about what does GDP actually tell us about the economy? We're going to figure out how we can compute GDP. And then we'll talk about what some shortcomings of GDP are, which there are always shortcomings in any measure. So we'll get into that. Now, macro versus micro. Macro is going to be economy-wide issues, whereas micro is going to deal with more individual-level decisions. Macro is going to be aggregate-level. Micro is households or form firms. So aggregate-level, these are things like inflation, unemployment, and economic growth. Households or firms, these are going to be things like individual markets, choices, and implications for prices and quantities. So much of our lives are spent at the micro level. Personally, we're trying to decide how to spend and, you know, how to live our life to the fullest extent possible with what we have. So all across the country, people just like you are making these same decisions, asking these same questions. And firms are doing the same thing when they're trying to decide what to produce, how to produce it, where to make it, all of this stuff with an aim towards making a profit. So this is all going to be more micro level. Micro is going to study individual level decision making. This is households or firms. When they say households, that can be you personally, your family, things like that. Firms are businesses, so anybody that's making a product, selling a product, providing a service. What we're more concerned with is macro. And macro is going to be the big picture. So instead of focusing on the success or failure of any person or firm, we're going to focus on the overall or the aggregate. So when we say aggregate, we're meaning overall success or failure of the entire economy. And by the entire economy, we could be talking about an entity as large as the United States or something more modest like the state of Illinois or the city of Chicago. So macro, we're looking at bigger groups of people. Uh, more specifically, macroeconomic concerns, the income of people throughout the economy. So we want to know our incomes rising, are they falling, what's happening in general. So right now, with everything that we have going on, this is a really interesting time in macroeconomics because we're taking these micro experiences that we're having, you know, loss of jobs, changes in income, changes in the availability of goods, changes in production, and we're looking at kind of what the effects are on a macro level. So how is this impacting our local economy in the city? How is it impacting our state economy? How is it going to impact the whole country? So macro will kind of give you the tools to answer some of those questions if you're interested in that. Um, some important questions that macroeconomists might try to answer just to give you an idea of what we're doing um, are why does the cost of living generally rise over time? When the economy is booming, why are some people still unemployed? What causes a recession? Can the government present a recession or stop a recession from getting worse? What is the government? budget deficit, what are the implications of a deficit, and why does the U.S. have a large trade deficit? So these are all questions that we would ask and answer in macroeconomics. And these are kind of the tools that we're going to give you in this class to go ahead and allow you to ask some of those questions yourself and be able to collect data and make informed decisions. So macroeconomics and the GDP. Let's go ahead and pop this slide up so you guys can look at it while we talk about it. GDP is going to be the most widely used measure of production. So in addition to measuring total output and input, or output and income, sorry, GDP is also used to measure the welfare of participants in society. So GDP is the total gross amount of everything that is produced within a specific economy. We use this measure to analyze economic growth. Typically, the higher the GDP, the better the economic growth. And we can use this to compare regions or even nations. So an important note here that's kind of going to get discussed more in depth later in the chapter is that some quality of life measures are not easily captured quantitatively. Now, what does this mean? Quantitative measures are numbers. It means that you can put a number on it, you can quantify it, it's like math, anything where you can get a definite number. Quality of life is not something that we can easily quantitate. And the reason being, what I think is a great quality of life may not be what you think is a great quality of life. Our standards of living and our expectations of quality of life can be very different than those in other countries. So this is kind of one of the caveats that comes with GDP. 
even though GDP is a proxy for well-being, we use it as a measurement for well-being, it does has, have a lot of different kind of shortcomings. So be mindful, there's a tension here between the desire to make economic measurements simple to understand and the true underlying quality of life that we can't easily capture quantitatively. So this benchmark, even though it has minor inadequacies, it's still better than no benchmark at all. And that's why GDP is one of the most widely used measures. Now, defining GDP, or gross domestic product, I'm going to go ahead and pop this slide up so you can look at it here for a second. GDP basically functions as our barometer for the economy. So what exactly does that mean? What it means is that when GDP goes up, this is implying that our national output and income are both higher. And when GDP falls, this implies that our economy is producing less than before and that total national income is falling. So output and income are essentially going to be the same. Nations that are producing a large amount of high value output are relatively wealthy. Nations that don't produce much high value output are relatively poor. The output you produce is sold and you get income from what you sell. So that's kind of how we're able to sort of equate output with income. And we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. We're going to skip these little videos during our lectures, but again, if you're looking back over these chapters and you need a little bit of extra context, definitely feel free to message me and I can send you the links for these videos. So three things here. We want to know why is GDP useful to examine? Well, first of all, GDP allows us to estimate the living standards across time and nations. What that means is it's sometimes hard to compare the U.S. to like Uganda, for example, or the U.S. to Europe. And this GDP measure gives us a more level playing field and gives us data that we can use. GDP is useful because it helps us measure economic growth. So it helps us identify, are we in an expansion? Are we in a recession? What's going on there? And also GDP allows us to determine whether an economy is experiencing short run expansions or recessions. So long term, we can use historical data to make decisions. And in the short term, we can figure out what exactly is going on. So as you can imagine, there are economists all over the world right now that are trying to figure out, is this going to be a short run recession? Is this going to be a long run recession? How will the stimulus checks and the government intervention help? Will they hurt? When are we going to get back to normal? All of these different things. So they're using this data right now to make decisions about what's going on with our life and with society. Now we're going to do a practice what you know question. Gross domestic product or GDP also measures what? So I'm going to give you guys a second to answer these before we move on. And remember, GDP is output, which is also equal to something else. So that's a little hint for this question. Very good. I see some answers coming in already. The answer is C. It measures a nation's income. So wonderful. You guys are doing a really good job. Now, whenever we're measuring living standards, total GDP, it's not going to be as accurate for cross-country comparisons because it does not adjust for the population size of a country. Now, what that means is that we just measure GDP in kind of generic terms. We don't really adjust for different sizes, different um, populations, things like that. Per capita GDP is a more accurate measure Per capita GDP just means GDP per person, and here's the formula. So I'm going to go ahead and pop this whole slide up so you can look at it. Definitely make a note of this formula. You will need it for your homework. You will need it for your exams. But per capita GDP, all we do is take our given GDP number and divide that number by the population of a country. This gives us average living standards in a nation. So they have an example here, and they're saying that China has a higher total GDP than Germany does. So if we were just looking at regular GDP, that's this column over here in billions, you would see China's number is much higher than Germany's. And if you didn't really know much about either country, that might lead you to believe that China is a wealthier or better off economic wise country than Germany is. Now, when we use the GDP per capita, we take these GDP numbers in this left hand column and we divide them by the populations of the countries. And these are things that you'll be given as well. 
But um, whenever we do divide them by the population, we get that China's 23 or 2013 GDP per capita was about $6,807 per person, whereas Germany's was about 46269 Now, a good way to think about GDP per capita, that's like saying the income per person on average in China for 2013 was only about $6,807 per year, whereas in Germany, the average income per person was about 46269 so when you look at these two numbers, it's now pretty evident that Germany is actually better off economically than China is, but you wouldn't know that just from these regular GDP numbers. It's this GDP per capita calculation that gives you a little bit more insight into what's actually going on. Now, something that it's important to kind of understand is this actually the average income per person? Not exactly. And we'll talk about that more on this next slide. So this is the world's largest economies. Um, and we're looking at these GDP. So we're organizing them by GDP in 2013. You can see that it has the GDP regular number, the GDP per capita numbers. And this first column is in billions. The second column is just in US dollars. And you can see that we have the U.S., then China, then Japan, Germany, all the way down. But when you start to do these per capita numbers, this list changes quite a bit. So it's important to understand that when you get GDP, you're just getting a total for the entire country. Whereas when you have GDP per capita, this is giving you an average per person. It's based on the population. And this is a much more accurate measure. There are people that aren't actually making $53,042 you know, $53, a year in the U.S. This is simply taking an average based on the population. Again, this might not be the most perfect measure because there's some people that maybe don't work. There's some people that don't make this much. Some people make significantly more than this. But this is simply an average number for the economy, and it does give you some more insight than just the GDP numbers do. Now, we can also use GDP data to measure economic growth over time or changes in our average living standards. So when economies grow and living standards rise, this can be indicated by an increase in the real GDP. The figure on this slide is figure 6.1, and this shows the change in inflation, inflation adjusted GDP per capita for the US from 1965 to 2015. So we have our years over here on the x-axis, and we have our average real income per person or our GDP per capita on the y-axis over here. And if you look at this graph, even if you don't really know a whole lot about GDP, you can see that this is trending upwards. And what that tells us is that living standards rose in the US over the past 50 years, even though growth wasn't necessarily positive in every year, you can see some dips here where the growth wasn't positive. So the question for you guys to kind of think about and maybe type an answer in or a comment is why can we infer or guess that living standards have risen in the U.S. over the past 50 years, even though our growth wasn't positive every single year? So I'll give you guys a second to kind of think about that. So, for example, you could say, why do you think that our standard of living today is better than it was for people living here 50 years ago? And when we discuss these increases in standards of living and long-run economic growth, we really want to be concerned with the overall trend. Yeah, so Alicia said advances in technology or regulation. That's very true. We have more technology. Um, production and technology have increased. Very good answers. Now, the important thing here when you're looking at these graphs is just look at the overall trend. Overall, this is going up, even though there's some short run fluctuations where we had some dips, we're really only concerned with what the bigger picture is. So great answers. Thank you very much for answering that. This graph is figure 6.2. And what this shows us is the change in GDP per capita for six different countries. So economic growth, or a lack thereof, varies dramatically across countries. Not every country grows by the standard, which is an annual 2% rate of the U.S. And you can see from this graph that 
you know, India was kind of level, and then they had some pretty significant growth here. Poland had a bit of a rocky fall here and then went back up. But you can see that not every country's growth in real GDP is going to be the same. It's all different. It all depends on what's going on in that country. And one of the main things that we're concerned with in this chapter is going to be measuring business cycles. So let me pop this slide up for you before we talk about it. Now, even if an economy is expanding in the long run, it's normal, as we saw in the graph of the U.S. growth in the real GDP per capita, to go through periodic contractions in GDP. So typically, economic growth follows a short-run pattern of alternating periods of expansion and contraction. These can be characterized by changes in employment, productivity, and interest rates, and this is the business cycle. A complete business cycle is a period of expansion and contraction. An expansion is from a tro in GDP to a peak in GDP. We'll talk about what that looks like in the next slide, so I'll give you a, vis a visualization here. But basically, tros are going to be those dips, the lower parts in our growth, and peaks are going to be those high, high areas where we're having expansions. During an expansion, total production and total employment are going to increase. A contraction is a recession, and this is going to be from a peak in GDP, which is the top of our growth, to a tro in GDP, which is those little valleys. During a contraction, total production and total employment are going to decrease. The idealized business cycle is relatively easy to define, but in real time, the phases of the business cycle are often very hard to identify. The National Bureau of Economic Research, which we'll see abbreviated as the NBER, they define a recession as a significant decline in economic activity that spreads across the economy, lasts more than a few months, is normally visible in real GDP, real income, employment, tell sales. Economists debate this definition along with some others, but um, there's a couple of reasons why that we'll cover here in a minute. And remember, not every business is going to have the same business cycle. The reason being, think about like seasonal businesses, right? If I own a business that's only open during the summer, if you didn't know I was only open in the summer, you would see that my income went to almost nothing or actually nothing during the winter months. And you might think that I was having a recession. But if you were to look at the big picture, a couple of years of data, you would see that every summer I went up to peaks, which was an expansion. And then every winter I went down to zero in these troughs. And that just means that my setup of my business is a little bit different than some others. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm doing bad. It just means that my business cycle is a little different. Now, all of this stuff might sound easier to understand. So I'm going to go ahead and move to the graph so that we can see what this looks like. So first click, what this is showing us is the short run path or a business cycle. You can see that we have ups, downs, ups, and downs. And just to put out some labels, these tops here are peaks, just to give you an idea of what I was talking about. These dips are going to be troughs when we get to the bottom, and then again up to a peak. When we're going from a peak or a high point down to a trough or a low point, this is a contraction. So think about this as real GDP is like income or output, and if we're going from higher output down to lower output, we're contracting. That's like a recession, things like that. If we're going from a low point or a tro up to a high point, a peak, we're having an expansion. So remember, real GDP is going from a lower number to a higher number. Output or income is going from lower to higher. This expansion. When we throw in this kind of trend line here, we can see that the long run trend of GDP in this case is upward. It means that we are growing. So even though we're having these peaks and troughs in our business cycle, which is the orange line, our long-run trend is what we're concerned about, and our long-run trend is going upwards. So whenever you're working on your homework and preparing for your next exam, this graph is a really good graphic to keep with you because it does explain the majority of this chapter in a simple picture. So definitely make a note. This is um, slide 17, or yeah, slide 17 in your slides. And I see a question saying it shows a trend. Yes, it does. So the blue line is our trend line or our long run what's going on. 
this orange line is just the short run. We want to see overall what's happening. If we took averages, if we had actual numbers, this long run line would show us a trend. So great comment there. And let's go ahead and move to a realistic example of this. So this image is figure 6.4 from your book. It's a plot of the U.S. real GDP over time with contractionary periods or official recession shaded. And I want you to see that during these shaded periods, it's a little hard to see the smaller ones. The bigger the shaded recession period, the more clear this is. Real GDP is consistently declining in these contractionary periods. So you might remember that there's a recession that began at the end of 2007. That's this great recession that we talk about all the time. And you can clearly see this episode happening in the data. Now, overall, we can see that this real GDP is trending upward if we're just looking at the big picture. But during these shaded recession areas, there are periods where we have a contraction or a recession that's happening. And this is just kind of showing you with the U.S. data what's happening. Yeah, yeah look, very but in reality, this period was a very trying period for the economy. And the point is to say that it is insignificant in the long run of things. But during these years, you know, 2007 to 2009, it was a very significant time in the short run. But long run, it is quite insignificant. So wonderful comments coming in. You guys are doing a great job. And I really appreciate the interaction. Now, when we're looking closely, we're talking about how do we measure the GDP and how do we figure it out? We want to know why does GDP count the market value? I'm going to go ahead and pop up the rest of the slide so we can talk about it. But we, we need to compute the market value of goods and services in order to aggregate and form the measure of GDP. So the market value of a good or service can be defined as the price per unit multiplied by the quantity produced. Quantities alone don't really provide enough information. The units for various quantities can't really be added together. It doesn't make sense to add gallons of milk, cups of coffee, pounds of steak, all of these different things. So even though we produce a lot more corn than cars, why are cars a more important part of our GDP than corn is? And I'm gonna give you guys a second to think about that question. We're saying quantities don't really provide us with enough information. The example they're giving here is that in 2010, the US produced 12 billion bushels of corn and 8 million cars. If we just look at these quantities, it would kind of tell us that maybe corn is more important to GDP relative to cars. But why is that not true? Why would cars maybe be more important to GDP than corn is, even though we only produced 8 million cars, but we produced 12 billion bushels of corn? Why would cars possibly be more important to our GDP than corn is? And I'll give you guys a second before we move to the next slide on this one. Okay, I see a couple of comments coming in. Other related costs, the value of the car. Very good. The cost of one car is far greater than the cost of one corn. That's really the most important answer here. Look at this next slide here. Now, if we're calculating the market value, we have 12 billion bushels of corn times $5 per bushel. The market value of all the corn we produced was $60 billion. Now, if we take the 8 million vehicles we produced times an average of $30,000 per vehicle, that was $240 billion. So the total market value here is $300 billion, but the market share of cars was much higher value-wise than the market share of corn. This is why it's really important to look at the quantities and the market value rather than just looking at the quantity by itself. If we just have the quantities by themselves, we don't really have enough information. And, oh, let's see. Can you see this slide now? It's the um, looking closely full of quantities and price. Is it still not showing? Make sure here. And it looks like something's not showing on your end. Price. And um, it should have the total of 300 billion on the slide. Can you guys see that on your end? 
Okay, it looks like you can see it now. Jessica, um, if you can't see it, oh, there you go. Okay, there might be a little bit of a delay. Um, I usually, I typically use an external Wi-Fi, but that hotspot is dead, so I have to use my home Wi-Fi, and it's not the best. So I apologize if there's a little bit of a delay because it uh, it's just not working very well today. So sorry about that. Thank you for letting me know, Jessica. Okay, so looking closely at how we measure the GDP to just get in a little bit more, GDP is going to include both goods and services. So let me pop up this slide so you can look at it. Goods are going to be tangible things. These are things that we can physically touch. It's going to include things like food, clothing, cars, and houses. Services are intangible. So it's not necessarily a product that you can put your hands on, but this is going to be things like healthcare, entertainment, advice, travel, banking. The composition of our industries and economy has really changed over the last 50 years, and we'll talk about what that is and why we think it's true. So what do you think we higher percentage of our GDP? Do you think that most of our GDP comes from goods that we produce, or do you think that most of U.S. GDP comes from services? I'll give you guys a second to answer that one before we move on. Services, that's a very good guess. That's very true. So a higher percentage of our GDP comes from services today than ever before. Today, services actually account for over two-thirds of our total output. And we'll talk about kind of why this is true in the coming slides, but wonderful guess. We used to be very goods-based, but today we're much more service-based. So this graph right here is figure 6.6. .6. And it's just showing you that over the past 50 years, one big shift that we've had in the U.S. particularly has been out of manufacturing goods and into services. In the past, our dominant industries in the U.S. were things like automobiles, steel, and household goods. But now, a majority of the U.S. GDP is service output. So this is things like financial advising, transportation, retail, technology services, and this is showing you um, that services as a share of the U.S. GDP since 1960 has grown. It used to be only about 50% here in 1960. So this 0.5 is showing you a percentage that in 1960, services were only about 50% of our GDP. And then up to 2015, you can see now that it's about 70% in 2013. So that's this peak right here. And today it's even higher. And the reason being is things like outsourcing. We don't really do a lot of um, stateside production on a large scale. Our industries are much more service focused. So again, wonderful guess. Now, an important distinction to make whenever we're talking about GDP and changes in GDP and things like that are intermediate versus final goods. So. Intermediate goods are goods that firms are going to repackage or bundle with other goods to be sold at a later stage. The examples I give here are milk sold to a coffee shop and tires sold to a car manufacturer. So the picture on the left is showing a customer buying a final good, which is the latte, and the inputs that are sold to the coffee shop are milk and coffee. These are intermediate goods. So now milk that's sold like to a consumer directly in a grocery store this would be considered a final good. But milk that's sold to a coffee shop to be put into coffee, this is an intermediate good because the final good here, the final purchasing item, is the latte. On the right side, we have a worker at a car manufacturer that's holding a tire. The tires that are sold to the car manufacturer are intermediate goods. The car is the final good. So the tire could only be a final good if it was sold directly to the consumer from an auto store. But in this case, they're selling the tires to the car manufacturer, the car manufacturer is putting the tires onto a car, and then the final good that's being actually sold is the car. Now, why do we care about intermediate versus final goods? Well, if we counted all of the goods that are ever produced, we would be counting a lot of things twice. In the example with the coffee 
So we can only count final goods that are sold directly to consumers, and this keeps us from double counting some items. Now, some more examples of final goods. Final goods are goods that are sold to the final users or consumers. It looks like it was buffering a little bit, so I'm sorry if there's a break there. But to get an accurate GDP estimate and avoid double counting, final goods are what we include in our GDP. Intermediate goods are not included in GDP. Now, if it's cutting out or if you guys can't hear me, if you'll just send the comment so far with this. Okay, I don't see any answers coming in. Can you guys hear me and see the screen okay? And again, I apologize for the technical difficulties today. The Wi-Fi is just a little overloaded. Okay, I see that a couple comments coming in now that there was some choppiness and then silence. Let me go ahead and go back a slide and recover that so that you guys don't miss this part because it is an important part of this chapter. Okay, so intermediate goods, just to kind of reiterate if it did cut out here, that these are things that are repackaged and bundled with something else that's sold at a later stage. So it was like milk and coffee being mixed together into a latte. The latte is the final good. The milk and the coffee are intermediate goods. The right side was showing tires sold to a car manufacturer. So it's like saying that the car manufacturer buys the tires. They put the tires onto a vehicle that they've built. The vehicle sold is the final good. The final good here would be the cell phone. So the chip right here is an intermediate good. Once the chip is put into the cell phone, the cell phone is sold and that is a final good. Very good, I see some comments coming in that intermediate is just the ingredients that we use to combine into other goods, it's very true. And the reason that we count money. Go ahead and to this asking account expenditures on intermediate goods. So I'll give you guys a second to catch up and to answer this question and then we'll move on. Okay, despite my choppy Wi-Fi, it looks like you guys are getting this. And the reason that we don't count intermediate goods is to avoid double counting. So very good, very good answer. Now let's go ahead and move on a little bit. This is just an example to kind of show you the intermediate steps in production and then move to the total final value. Um, this example we're not going to go through just for the sake of time since we're a little bit behind on this slide, but it is um, just to give you an idea of value that's added and then the final sell price and to show you that this total price of 338 is what would be included in our GDP, not all these intermediate good um, options that happen. So production from a particular period 
we want to avoid issues with double counting. A new car is produced and sold in 2014. Two years later, the owner decides to sell it. Now, now the sale of financial assets such as stocks and bonds is not going to count towards GDP. Whenever we sell financial assets, these are gonna be transfers of wealth and they're not actually new production. With this particular example, if we have a new car that is produced and sold in 2014 and then two years later, the owner decides to sell it, we don't recount a good that was produced two years ago. Therefore, used cars that are resold, these do not count in GDP because we've already counted them whenever the car was first sold. We would be counting that car twice, even though it was only produced once. So remember, used cars, um, financial assets like stocks and bonds, these are not going to count in GDP. A couple of important caveats here, brokerage fees are not going, these are count as payment for a service. We do include the brokerage fees in GDP. Now that would be like the fee that you pay a financial advisor or somebody that manages a portfolio. If money from a stock purchase is used by a firm for investment, the amount that is used for investment is included in GDP. These are kind of very finicky and specific caveats here. I'm not gonna quiz you on like the kind of finer finesses of like what is and isn't counted. Of an important thing to note. I'm gonna let it catch up. Okay, so looking at GDP as different types of expenditures, the Bureau of Economic Analysis is the government agency that tallies GDP data, and this is called national income accounting. This formula on this slide is a very important formula. You definitely wanna write it down. Y is output, so that's GDP is basically what this formula is for. And GDP is equal to consumption plus investment plus government purchases plus net exports. Now we're gonna walk through what each component of this means, but just know that net exports, this NX is gonna be exports minus imports. That's gonna give us that net export number. So I didn't tell you guys this already, so I'm gonna go ahead and just give you this one. But the biggest component of GDP is consumption. So definitely make a note that in any country, the biggest component of GDP is consumption, but specifically in the US. Consumption is much bigger than the other components in the US. It's about $10 trillion a year. Um, net exports are typically actually going to be negative in the US because we import more than we export. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing to import more than you export, it just means that our particular economy is more service-based, so we tend to bring in a lot of consumer goods, more goods than what we're able to export. This table right here is table 6.4, and it's just kind of showing you a breakdown of the different GDP categories in 2015 in the US. So if you're trying to kind of start understanding this chapter, this is a great table to look at. It shows you a breakdown of consumption, durable goods, non-durable goods and services. It shows you what investment was, government purchases, and then exports are net exports, exports minus imports. And it shows you the percentages of GDP that these look at this outside of this class time. So you have a chance to kind of understand what the US GDP is made up of. And even though this number is from 2015, they're very similar to what it is today. So definitely take a look at that. Consumption can be subdivided into three different categories. So we have our durable goods, our non-durable goods, and services. Durable goods are goods that we consume over a long period. So that would be things like cars or appliances. These are more subject to cyclical fluctuations, so people tend to postpone buying goods when the economy is struggling. Think about right now, if you have a big item that you've been wanting to purchase, you're probably not very likely to go out and buy that item right now. One reason being um, a lot of the stores are closed. Another reason being you maybe don't have as much disposable income as you typically do or you're concerned about how the economy is doing. 
So like, let's say you have a fridge that works pretty decently, but you've been wanting to buy a new expensive big fridge. You probably would put off buying this new expensive big fridge for as long as you could because it's a big investment. It's a very big purchase. These non-durable goods, these are goods that we consume over a very short period of time. So it's things like groceries, medicines, uh, magazines. These aren't really as affected as much by fluctuations in our cycles. Um, Non-durable goods don't last very long. So typically we're purchased, um, we're purchasing these goods irrespective of the economic environment. We're going to buy groceries. The people that we durable goods during contractions. And again, so I'm sorry about that. But I think typically that in the replay of these videos, after we finish the class, that it should sound better in the replay. So if there's a part that was a little choppy, it might sound a little bit better in the replay. If it doesn't sound better, please, any segments that you have questions on, post your question in the questions and answers discussion. I'll be checking that every day, and I'll, I'll be happy to provide additional clarification there. Um, is it too choppy to continue, or is it back to where you can hear everything okay? Uh, I see the first part of your question that says, is to go up to my office and use their Wi-Fi? Um, I have to just stay at home unless it is an emergency, so it's not great. I will have the hotspot. No, that's okay. I will have a hotspot for our next class. My screen is not working here. I'll have my hotspot ready to go for Thursday, so it should be a little better on Thursday. So I'm so sorry. I know that this is not a great connection today, but I am happy to post, like I said, in a discussion for questions and answers. Any questions that you have, I'll definitely provide extra clarification. So thank you guys for sticking it out. I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next slide. So investment, that's the I in the GDP formula. This is gonna include things, oh, sorry, like capital purchases, so buying machinery, equipment, things like that. Now I appreciate you guys trying to offer solutions for sure. Um, I said, just trying to find a solution, me too. <laughs> so thank you for that, I appreciate it. Um, so investment, this is capital purchases, things like machinery, equipment, computers, changes in our inventory, new housing. This is not going to include purchases of stocks and bonds. So capital purchases, this is going to be any private spending on goods that are used to produce future output. It can be small things like tools or big things, like I said, equipment, computers, and factories. Inventories are things that we produce, but we have not sold yet. So these are going to represent a future increase in output. An example here would be a large book company that is confident that the demand for books is going to be big in the months ahead. So they go ahead and print a lot more books than they usually would. They increase their supplies of paper so they don't have a shortage. Um, the paper takes a long time to delivery. So to deliver, so they go ahead and order it in advance so that they can print all of these books when demand does. Are you as a consumer and go out and buy a home? This is going to account as investment, not consumption. And the reason being is because this purchase is something that will last you a very long time. Now, government purchases, this is going to be the G in the GDP equation. This is going to be spending by our state, local, and federal governments on goods and services, but transfer payments are not included. So just to give you a little more detail on this, government purchases are going to include spending on goods and services. So um, employee salaries of government employees, 
public works projects, schools, national defense, post office. These are all going to be GDP government spending. Transfer payments, the things that are not included, are government outlays to households. So this is going to be things like welfare and Social Security. They're not included as part of government purchases because even though these payments do increase household income, it doesn't really fit into the expenditure definition of GDP. Now, when households go out and spend this income, it does enter GDP as a part of consumption, but the payments of Social Security and welfare themselves, these are not included in GDP because they're transfer payments. Net exports, this is a pretty simple part of the equation. So net exports, we just take our exports minus our imports. Remember, exports are what we're sending out to other countries. Imports are what we're bringing in. If imports are bigger than exports, our net exports number is going to be less than zero, like it is with the U.S., and that means that we're in a trade deficit. If exports are greater than imports, our net export number would be greater than zero, and we'd have a surplus. So that's not um, the situation in the U.S., Net exports is a very small fraction of total GDP, and it's not necessarily bad to be in a trade deficit. So imports, we subtract these from the total level of GDP because they were not produced here, even though we use them here. And the reason that we measure GDP is to measure domestic production only. Exports enter positively into the GDP, so we add those because these are items that are part of domestic production. In chapter 19, which is much later this semester, we'll talk about exports in a lot more detail. But just know that a trade deficit is not necessarily bad. Even though it does decrease our GDP, all else being equal, a trade deficit really just implies that people in the U.S. are consuming a lot more goods and services. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. And we don't have to worry about that very much much because it is a very small portion of our GDP. Now let me pop up this slide before we talk about it. So generally prices rise over time. So if we don't take this into account whenever we're measuring GDP and try to make historical comparisons, it's likely that we're going to overestimate increases in GDP. Now the way that we account for this is with nominal GDP. So nominal GDP is calculated by aggregating the market value, which is the price times quantity of goods and services during any given time period. The prices at the time the GDP is calculated are used to compute the nominal GDP. So GDP is intended to measure changes in production. We want to be sure that we hold prices constant over time to kind of account for inflation. Real GDP, this is going to be GDP that is adjusted for inflation. We have a particular year that's going to be our base year. And the price of goods and services in that base year are what we use to calculate the market value of the goods and services other years. This just means that we're adjusting GDP for inflation. It's just a really long-winded way of saying that. The GDP deflator, you'll see that a lot in this chapter. This is going to be a broad price level index. And we use this GDP deflator to remove inflation from nominal GDP and calculate real GDP. So this all sounds a little complicated. But basically, real GDP is inflation-adjusted GDP, and nominal GDP is normal or currently priced measurement of prices. So here's a practice what you know. How is real GDP different from nominal GDP? Very good. The answer to this one is A. Real GDP is inflation adjusted, while regular nominal GDP is not. So just to show you graphically, this blue line is what nominal GDP would look like with current prices. This red line down here is real GDP. The difference between the two is just an adjustment for inflation. So that's just to kind of graphically show you what real GDP looks like in comparison to nominal GDP. Now, the next few slides use numbers from this table. Um, we're not going to be able to do all of these examples because we are running a little short on time. But I do want to go ahead and move you to this formula to show you what formula you'll use. Now, there are two steps to converting nominal GDP to real GDP. 
The first step is we divide nominal GDP by the price level in the current year, and then we multiply by the price level in the base year, which is always going to be 100. Now, it's important to note here, multiplying by 100 does not make this value a percentage. Instead, it converts the unit to base year prices. Now, let's go ahead and look and see what um, this looks like in an example here. So we're finding the real GDP for 2014. We take the numbers from that table, 6.5, and we're going to plug them in. So T, or the year that we're trying to calculate here, is 2014. And they're just taking numbers from that previous table and plugging them in here. Now, now I'm going to go back a couple slides so we can look at where these numbers came from and how they plugged them in. Because this is the slide that I would definitely recommend using when you're working on your homework. So T, the time period here, we're wanting to calculate real GDP for 2014. Now, nominal GDP is the top. We're dividing that by the price level. Then we multiply by 100. So if we go back to this graph, we find the year 2014. Nominal GDP they just took from right here. And then the price level is given right here. So again, all they're doing is taking numbers from this table and plugging them in. They took the nominal GDP that was given, divided by the price level that was given, multiplied by 100. And you can see now that that's the real GDP for 2014. It's inflation-adjusted GDP. That would be a better number to use for comparisons or trying to calculate um, changes based on historical data. Now, this is 2014 real GDP in 2009 prices. What that means is we took out all the inflation from 2009 to 2014 to give us a better number. What you'll notice here is that real GDP is always going to be a little lower typically than the nominal GDP, and that's because the nominal GDP includes inflation, real GDP does not. Growth rates, this is another important formula here. Um, the triangle here, if you've taken in a lot of math classes, means change. So this is the percent change formula. And we're using the new value minus the old value, all divided by the old value. So new value is value T. Old value is value T minus 1. So again, the T just indicates new value. T minus 1 indicates an old value. You're not actually taking something minus 1. This is just to show you what you're plugging in. New value, old value, divided by old value. This formula down here where it shows you the percent change in GDP from 2011 to 2012, this might be a little bit easier of a formula to see and understand. It's the same thing. They're taking 2012 GDP minus 2011 GDP divided by 2011, all multiplied by 100. Now, multiplying by 100 here is not the same as before. Here, the 100 is used to convert the decimal to a percentage. So it's telling you that the GDP growth in 2012 was what percentage from the change in 2011. When they plug in those numbers from the graph that we've looked at before, table 6.5, up with 4.1%. Now, what 2011 to 2012? And I realize that there's a lot of formulas in this chapter. The math is not really hard. It's just the plugging in things that can be a little bit difficult. If you start to work on your homework and you're having any trouble with this, definitely post in the discussion Q&A, send me a text, call me. We can work through some example problems. Once you get the hang of these, they're really not that bad. It's just a matter of being able to identify where you need to put things and getting comfortable with that. So if you don't feel great about this right now, I promise you'll feel a little better the more of your homework that you work on. So the price level or GDP deflator growth rate is going to be the price level growth rate or the percent change in the price level. All they're doing here is the same thing. New number minus old number divided by the old number. So all three things right here are given. This is always 100. It's just a matter of taking what is given and figuring out how to kind of add those numbers together. We really won't get very deep into these in this particular class. This is really just an introduction to what's going on here. So all that I want you to be able to do is to look at these formulas and plug in given information. I'm not expecting you to 
really make like strong, you know, inferences from your answers. I just want you to be able to say that like here, the price level change was 1.9%. It went up 1.9%. If this was a negative number, I would want you to be able to understand that it went down by a percentage. So don't get really wrapped up in the complexities of the math here. Just definitely message me if you're having any trouble and we can work on this some more in our discussion board. Now, just to get through a couple more slides, we don't have any more new formulas. So if you hate that part, you can take a deep breath. That's done. E. Measure of production, we use it as a proxy for well being, but one being non market goods, one being quality, leisure. There's many different things. But why would these be shortcomings? Well, first off, we'll talk about each of these things in the next couple of slides. So non-market goods, these are goods and services produced but not sold. What does that mean? Did household activities, washing dishes, mowing lawns, cleaning. We're really um, unable to distinguish how goods are produced in GDP. So non-market goods, things like doing chores, mowing your lawn, etc., these create value for society but they're not directly compensated. So when the non-market segment of the economy is large, there can be a pretty dramatic undercounting of the annual output being produced. This is gonna be a lot more prevalent in less developed countries. So in less developed societies where houses produce a lot of their own goods, GDP not, might not be a good measure. And what that means is we don't produce a lot of goods within our home here, but in other countries when they're doing a lot of their own production, they're not really going out and buying things. GDP doesn't count that because it's a non-market good, and it might not be really giving us an adequate measure. Environment quality, this is really important. Um, environment quality is not included in GDP, but low environmental standards can lead to health issues and a lot of other undesirable features. So generally, we're going to assume that people are going to assign a positive value to beautiful scenery, clean air, clean water, but we don't really count any of these in GDP. In fact, it's often the case that countries with greater GDP have a lot more pollution. So GDP might not be an accurate measure of well-being because if a country has a really high GDP, but they're super like polluted and things are really gross, there's not really a lot of um, well-being there. So again, if these two countries have equal GDP, their well-being might not be the same because in country A, clean energy and clean air, the standard of living is a little higher versus country B with no environmental standards, it might not be great to live there. So the underground economy, this is a major shortcoming of GDP. Now, what is the underground economy? There's two different stems here. First stem that you probably think of first is going to be the illegal side, right? They call it narcotics exchanges. That would be, you know, drug dealers, prostitution, anything that is illegal that's happening on the underground. Do you think that these narcotics exchanging managers are reporting all of their income to the government every year on their tax return? Do prostitutes report all of their income? No, they don't. So obviously this isn't included in GDP, even though it is production. Now, on the legal side, you have things like waitress tips and babysitting. If you've ever waited tables, have you always reported 100% of the tips that you earned on your tax return? Do you always claim all your babysitting money, all of these things? A lot of people don't. The size of the underground economy, we estimate that in the U.S., it's 10% of our GDP. Now, what that means is, is that our GDP could be increased by another 10% if we included all of the illegal activities of production that were going on, all of the legal but unrecognized or paid under the tables items of production, but in developing countries where there's not as much government structure, this can be up to 45% of their economy. So that's pretty huge to not be included. But again, you don't really have a lot of people that are super willing and excited to report the income from illegal activities. Leisure time is another pretty significant trade-off here. So this is the trade-off between labor and leisure and the average work week. And this is just kind of showing you different average work weeks in different countries. So South Korea, it's 46 hours. The Netherlands, it's 28 hours. The U.S. and Japan are both about 36 hours. 
And the question here is, you know, who, who's better off? Higher levels of GDP are highly correlated with a better environment, higher quality and better access to healthcare, more education, more leisure time. But we don't know exactly how to quantify this leisure time. So GDP is correlated with, with most of these other major measures anyway. But alternative measures of you know leisure and how much free time we have, there's not a great way to put a number on these. Some other measures of well-being, life expectancy, education, access to health care, and crime rates. If you weren't just looking at GDP, you could look at some of these other numbers to kind of gauge the well-being of a country. So if people are expected to live very long, you could assume that their well-being was a little higher than a country that maybe had a very short life expectancy. The more educated a population is, the higher their well-being tends to be. Not always true, but also very true. Access to health care and crime rates. Again, the higher the crime rate, then the lower the well-being is, obviously. The lower crime rate, the better off their well-being is. GDP is tied to a lot of these, but these are just some other measures we can do to fill in those gaps of quantifying how well we're doing. One more question. Which of the following things do you think would not be included in GDP? So remember, this is talking about the underground economy. It could be legal or illegal. But what does not get included in GDP in this um, problem right here? So remember, it's not included in GDP if the income is not easily reportable. B, very good. So Michael paying the neighbor kid to mow his lawn, this is not something that would be reported in GDP. GDP, the neighbor kid, he's very dishonest. He doesn't report his wages. Um, overall, in this chapter, we learned a measure of economic output, which is GDP, the market value of all final goods and services that are produced in a nation within a specific period are going to be your GDP numbers. Um, we use this GDP to examine economic growth, fluctuations in economic activity to determine a long run trend, and to make comparisons between countries. So I realized that this particular lecture was very choppy. We had a lot of technical difficulties, and I'm so sorry about that. Please um, definitely look over this chapter, and I'll start next lecture with questions on this chapter. So if you're feeling a little confused or stressed, don't worry. We're not done talking about this yet, and we can cover whatever you want to next Thursday. We'll go over the next chapter, but I'll also answer questions. Yeah, the hotspot, I'll have to be a little careful. Luckily, I have an unlimited hotspot. It's just a very dead hotspot right now. So I will make sure to have that ready. That is my bad completely. But you guys have been great. You're wonderful. And I really appreciate you working so hard. I'll update the Chapter 4 participation grades. I will get that exam review for your next exam posted today. I have already curved your exam grades. If you don't have any questions, Go ahead and log off. I will be sticking around to answer questions if anybody has any now. But thank you guys again. I really appreciate your patience and I hope you guys are doing really well. And if you don't have any questions, I will talk with you on Thursday. So thank you so much.
So I see Jessica posted a question asking for an example of how the per capita GDP is measured. I'm going to go ahead and go back a couple of slides to the beginning here to go over one of those examples. So if this makes you sick, don't look at my screen for a second. Okay. So let me go back on my notes here. Whenever we're calculating that um, per capita GDP, all that we're doing is taking the total GDP number that we're given and dividing that number by the population. So let's see if it gives some information on what the population levels actually were for this example. Just one second. So we have, we're looking at 2013 GDP and we just have our regular GDP numbers in this column right here. And then we have our per capita numbers here. It doesn't actually give me the population for this example. So let's just like pick a random country. So let's say US, right? Let me go ahead and minimize this. So if you were gonna do this on your own, you could just Google the US population in let's say 2016, because we know that that number will be available to us. So we know that in 2016, the US population was 323.1 million. So maybe go ahead and write that number down, that 2016 U.S. population was um, 323.1 million. Then, once we know what the population is, we'll go ahead and Google what the U.S. GDP was in 2016. And we see that that GDP was 18.71 trillion. So the way that we would do this is we would go ahead and divide that 18.71 trillion by the 323.1 million. Um, it's really good to um, you know, write out these numbers and knock off some zeros to make the math a little bit easier, but that's all they're doing. So I'm glad that that kind of helps you out there, Jessica. They're literally just taking population numbers that are given in your by itself was 18.71 trillion in 2016 and the population was this calculate the real GDP per capita or the GDP per capita so they'll give you all that information in your problems the slide just didn't really provide a great um, example on that so very good question I bet a lot of people were a little confused about that so thank you very much for asking do you guys have any other questions before we hop off today Okay, I don't see any more questions. Oh, thank you, Jessica, for asking. I don't see any more questions coming in right now, but definitely feel free to text me or send me an email if your question didn't get answered. Um, again, I appreciate you guys so much, and I will see you guys on Thursday. Thank you so much.